some of you may know a scandal in Britain that, uh, like most scandals, both appalls and entertains the population. Uh, it's been discovered that many members of Parliament have been extravagant in their claims for expenses. Some, for example, have claimed uh, mortgage relief on their second homes, but are often uh, uh, homes allegedly made necessary by their uh, political careers, when in fact they have no mortgage. Uh, in another case, a left-wing member of Parliament, uh, previously respected for his independence of thought, claimed $27,000 for bookcases in his home one year before he was due to retire. Uh, he was granted uh, only, uh, only $12,000. The leader of the opposition claimed $900 for the removal of the hysteria from the chimney of his house. And my particular favorite was one we did yesterday. A member of parliament claimed, I've forgotten the amount, for the construction of an island in his pond for his ducks. <laughs> On the one hand, we have a population that is increasingly unself-controlled, 
even in very small matters. On the other hand, a state of unprecedented surveillance by the state, by parastatal organizations, and by private, that is to say, which is not quite the same thing, non-state organizations. An amusing but uh, serious book was written recently about a man's attempt to go from London to Southend, a journey of perhaps 30 miles at the most, without appearing on a video surveillance camera. And it was quite impossible, in fact, it was impossible to go further than a few hundred yards, even using the most circuitous route. About a third of all the video surveillance cameras in the world are now installed in Britain. And the average Briton is said to be uh, photographed uh, 300 times, about 300 times a day, as he goes about his uh, daily business. You can only avoid becoming a film star by staying indoors. <laughs> but the government now uh, wants to go further. It wishes to monitor every telephone call you make and every uh, email you both send and receive. Uh, this desire, of course, is justified by an appeal to the struggle against terrorism. Such terrorism exists, of course, but it is notable that actual terrorists, of whom there are very few, are caught and their attempts follow not by surveillance of, for example, my conversations with my friends, because it's very unlikely that at my age and the scores of millions of other people are suddenly going to resort to blowing ourselves up with bombs uh, in public places, but by the methods that will be familiar to the readers of Joseph Conrad's novels about revolutionaries and revolutionary anarchists. Terror is too strong a word, perhaps, for what the British government is selling, but it is selling an unease in everyone, um, provided only that he is innocent of serious wrongdoing. The serious wrongdoers, of course, are not intimidated by all this at all. Here, I think it's worth recalling de Tocqueville's famous and increasingly prophetic words in his democracy in America. Above the population, an immense tutelary power is elevated, which alone takes charge of assuring their enjoyments and watching over their fate. It is absolute, detailed, regular, far-seeing, and mild. It would resemble paternal power, power if, like that, it had for its object to prepare man for manhood. But on the contrary, it seeks only to keep them fixed irrevocably in perpetual childhood. It likes citizens to enjoy themselves, provided that they think only of enjoying themselves. It willingly works for their happiness, but it wants to be the unique uh, agent and sole arbiter of that. It provides for their security, foresees and secures their needs, facilitates their pleasures, conducts their principal affairs, directs their industry, regulates their estates, and divides their inheritances. Can it not take away from them entirely the trouble of thinking and the pain of living? Well, this tutelary power in Britain, at least, is singularly ineffective, even in the most obvious terms of its goals, in part at least because, as yet, it lacks utter and consistent ruthlessness. Let me uh, give you a, a little example. Recently, I wrote a short book on the social meaning of litter and littering in Britain. In the last few years, and it doesn't really matter exactly how many, Britain has become by far the most littered country in Western Europe. And in the course of the preparation of this book, I happen to notice, not very far from where I live, a large notice on a wall. No littering. Litterers will be fined £2,000, that's about $3,000. Well, it will come as no surprise to you know, to know that strewn all about the vicinity, to an extent not seen elsewhere, was a huge quantity of litter. It is as if it had been dropped there uh, with specific satirical effect, <laughs> or in defiance of what to Tocqueville called the issue of the park. Incidentally, litter bins in Britain, often even when empty, have large amounts of litter strewn around them, <laughs> as if people knew that litter bins had something to do with litter. <laughs> In other words, the tutelary power in Britain threatens, but most of its menaces are as yet empty. Of course, this one day could change. 
Now, let us uh, consider for a moment a comparatively tiny matter of this one. I personally have a deep aversion to disposing of anything of which I might wish to disembarrass myself, almost amounting to a physical impossibility, an inability for me to do so in a public place. And I dare say, uh, and I certainly hope, most people in this room probably have the same aversion. Now, the question is, where does this aversion come from? Why would I rather carry a screwed up paper bag with, around with me all day, uh, and rather than just throw it on the ground where I, wherever I happen to be? And I think the answer is clear. It's because my mother told me not to. <laughs> she instilled in me at an early age that this is not what one does. Although I can't actually remember, I doubt very much whether in first telling me that I should not throw a little on the ground, she gave me a deep, detailed and deep explanation as to why I should not. Her injunction would have depended far more actually on maternal authority than on rational argument. Indeed, whether she could have provided such a rational argument, at least one that stood up to full philosophical investigation, is doubtful. I'm far from entirely sure that I could myself provide an absolutely foolproof argument that any rational man would be compelled to accept as to why I did not litter the streets or why somebody else should not litter the streets. When I have something unwanted, me, that unwanted about me then, I do not have this deep philosophical struggle within me as to whether or whether I should, whether I should or should not drop it where I stand. I do not weigh up the pros and cons of doing so, nor do I have a deep philosophical dialogue uh, within in an attempt to find the Cart Cartesian point from which all moral judgments might properly and intuitively be derived. I do not, for example, conclude that utilitarianism is the only satisfactory account of moral judgment and then go on from there to decide whether I believe in act or rule utilitarianism. The question of throwing the litter on the ground doesn't even arise in the first place, thanks to my mother's training, thanks to the fact that she told me not to. Now this surely is true of a great deal of behavior that passes, if not for virtuous, at least for decently social. You are polite to people, you do not push in front of them, and so on and so forth, not because on every occasion you work out from first principles that it is better for you to behave in that fashion, but because you have a deeply ingrained and pre-rational disposition, a, dispos a predisposition that does not derive from nature. For left to itself, nature would probably have made you, and certainly would have made me, a little savage. Your realization that there are rational, though perhaps not decisive arguments for politeness and not pushing your way in front of others and so on and so forth, comes much later in your life. However, I think we live in an age with a profound suspicion of pre-rational dispositions, or prejudices, if you like. The model of behavior that is most prevalent is that each sovereign individual decides for himself using what Burke called the stock of his rationality to decide how best to behave. Every single action is open to moral examination, and if no decisive and self-generated argument can be found against doing something, then that something, whatever it might be, is permissible according uh, to the moral law. Let me again give you a small but concrete example from Britain. A very high percentage of young people in Britain now appear to believe, at least if their behaviour is anything to go by, that unoccupied seats in front of them on trains are in effect footstools provided <laughs> for their level. That is to say, they put their feet up on them, often with a notice above them that say, uh, please do not put your feet up on the seat, with a warning that they are under video surveillance. <laughs> now this is indeed curious because very old people 80-year-olds weighed down with luggage or shopping, even those with swollen legs who must surely be quite tired, never put their feet up on the seats opposite them. If you tackle a young person with his feet up on the seat, having first gone in, I must 
made very little of the science of physiognomy, uh, deciding from the look of him that he's not carrying a knife. <laughs> <laughs> No look of feral malignant. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can be stabbed if you address words that someone doesn't wish to hear. Uh, you will soon be engaged on a deep metaphysical discussion as to the basis of the moral judgment that people should not put up their feet on the traits seats opposite them. And as with any such judgment, it is in fact extremely difficult to find a conclusive argument that all rational people must agree with. Metaphysics of this kind is always used in a permissive sense, to render permissible what was previously impermissible. However, I do not think it takes much effort of the imagination to understand that this metaphysical egotism, what it can easily lead to, no public uh, uh, agreement as to ways of behaving. Every last trivial act is open to re-examination, and everyone is able, and indeed enjoined as a responsible citizen and fully independent human being, to interpret the social code in his own way. Unfortunately, man uh, being what he is, the interpretation is usually favorable to his desires of the moment, which may, of course, make life intolerable for others. Any other judgment that does not arise from deduction from first principles discovered by the person himself is given the name of prejudice. And there is, of course, a prejudice against prejudice. It is not difficult to see why certain prejudices have indeed been horrible and led to frightful persecutions. What is less appreciated, of course, is that these persecutions themselves have had to come overcome contrary prejudices. Lenin, for example, called a great deal of what commonly passed for morality as putting bourgeois prejudice, that is to say, something mean spirited, self interested, without recognition of its own self interest. You don't have to know much about life to know that this is sometimes an apt description of what sometimes passes for morality, but the part is not the whole and should not be taken as such. The example of harmful prejudice that everyone is willing and anxious to quote is that of Nazi Germany. For example, Daniel Goldhagen made out that the whole of German history, more or less, was but a preparation for this acting out for prejudice. What is often forgotten, of course, is that the enactment itself required the destruction, the, the self-conscious destruction of other prejudices. And similarly, the overcoming of petty bourgeois prejudice in Russia led regularly and for many years uh, to a more violent state procured deaths in a day, day after day, for decades, than the Tsarist regime, overthrown, apparently for moral reasons, procured in an entire century. Day after day, more people were killed in a single day than the Tsarist regime had killed in one century. Now, with regard to, uh, to, to other matters, the philosopher Peter Singer, whom you may know, his idea of morality is utterly universal. No person is supposed to consider those about him, his own child, for example, as being more important than a child, shall we say, in outer Mongolia. Similarly, the person in outer Mongolia is not supposed to consider his child more important than uh, my child. It is not difficult to see what a world would be like in which such a lack of prejudice in favor of the people around one would actually be like. It would be intolerable. With regard to countries like Britain, the disorder consequent upon the complete individualization, if you like, of the moral code, the refusal, which in my view is egotistical, to accept any constraining judgment that does not arise from a person's own reasoning from first principles, and of course the first principles have to be his own discovery of as well, results in what amounts to an invitation to the state to intervene and decide everything for us, for obvious reasons, where disorder comes then there is a need for more public authority. Moreover, talk of rights exacerbated.
exacerbates the problem for many people suppose that a right is a metaphysical entity that can be neither circumscribed nor withdrawn. Any circumscription means that the right is not in fact a right, and since it is a right, it cannot be circumscribed. Let me take a very simple example from my clinical experience. I worked as a doctor. People would sometimes uh, be driven to destruction by a neighbor who played music very loudly at all times of the day and night. And this is a terrible thing for anyone who's had this experience. If asked to desist, the offender would claim it is right to play his music as he liked. The complainant then had two choices. First, the resort to public authority, for example, the police, and second, personal violence. Usually, he resorted to both in that order, once the police, so obtrusive in many ways, had failed to secure him the peace that he desired. At the moment in Britain, uh, uh, which, as I said, I think is in the vanguard of these undesirable developments, we have a noxious combination of disorder and authoritarianism. Both arise from a refusal to recognize the social, socially constructive and perhaps inevitable role of prejudice and an overemphasis on its harmful role. I'll finish by quoting Dr. Johnson, who, as usual, made observations which are simultaneously obvious and profound and come with a force of revelation. In his life of Jonathan Swift, a man he didn't much like or admire, he said this, whatever he, this is uh, Jonathan Swift, did, he seemed willing to do in a manner peculiar to himself without sufficiently considering that singularity, as it implies a contempt of the general practice, is a kind of defiance which justly provokes the hostility of ridicule. He, therefore, who indulges peculiar habits, is worse than others if he be not better. <laughs> Please note here that Dr. Johnson does not claim that convention and prejudice is always and everywhere best. He's never to be challenged thought about or overthrown. In fact, there has never been an individual more individual than Dr. Johnson. Alas, we have all too often forgotten the subsidiary and traditional clause of his statement, and the one that makes it profound. If he be not better, in attacking prejudice, it is that conditionality that is disregarded. And by disregarding it, we give longer standby to the state to become what the Marquis de Christine said that the Emperor Nicholas I was, namely, eagle and insect. Thank you.